focus in on many of the on many of the materials in Scripture that help us to understand even more clearly uh, various aspects of this festival time. It is appropriate that, as the Scripture tells us, that we should focus on meat and due season, and as we approach God's festival seasons, uh, it is appropriate that we focus in on these occasions and that we understand uh, more fully and in greater detail uh, many of the lessons that God would have us to learn. And one of the things that so uh, that is so fundamental to the meaning and the significance of the day of Pentecost has to do with God's whole and an understanding of God's Holy Spirit and what God's Holy Spirit does for us and what it is that uh, we should be involved. Now, the Apostle Paul makes the statement in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, and it is primarily upon this statement that I wish to focus our attention this morning because there are some very important things that are gained right here. Now, there are many aspects of the day of Pentecost and various uh, things that uh, certainly will be addressed uh, that uh, I won't be here with you next Sabbath, but the following Sabbath, the Sabbath right before Pentecost, uh, I'll be here, which, by the way, brings me to, to an announcement I had meant to uh, make and, and didn't, and that is the fact, remember, that the Sabbath prior to Pentecost, services are reversed. We'll have services here, but services for Lafayette will be at 2.30, and uh, for Baton Rouge will be at 10 o'clock. That's on the Sabbath uh, uh, just before, that's what, the 29th, isn't it? 29th of, uh, 29th of uh, May. And uh, then, of course, uh, on uh, Sunday, the 30th, Pentecost services here in Lafayette at the Hotel Acadiana with the morning service at 10 and the afternoon at 2.30. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, I will... Uh, the na- the uh, Two weeks from today, when I'm back here with you, uh, I, I will follow up on some of this uh, a little more fully in other aspects of, of uh, Pentecost because there are many things that can be addressed. But one of the things of which we often focus is, of course, the fact that uh, in Acts chapter 2 we have the description of God's Holy Spirit being poured out. And what is the Spirit of God? Uh, what is its purpose and, and how are we to utilize it? The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6 Uh, told Timothy, he said, Wherefore I put you in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God which is in you by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now what we find right here are several things about the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God, first and foremost, is something that we have placed within us. We have it placed within us through the laying on of hands after baptism. Now, there are two primary examples or illustrations that the Scripture draws concerning the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit of God is something that is poured out. It is something that flows. Uh, It is not, uh, you know, very clearly from a scriptural standpoint, it is certainly not some... A third person of a, of a trinity uh, that uh, has its origin in, in paganism and came into the early Catholic Church through the uh, Greek philosophers, the Neoplatonists, as they were called in the in the second and third century. The Holy Spirit that the Scriptures speak of is the very power of God poured out by God from God. The two analogies that are used in the Scripture first is is air or wind. The word that is used in the Hebrew language that is translated spirit is the Hebrew word ruach, uh, R-U-A-C-H if you're wanting to spell it out. Or in the Greek language, in the New Testament, it is the word pneuma, spelled out, spelled with a P, P-N-E-U-M-A. And both of those words have basically the same meaning. They are words that have as their root meaning wind or air or breath. And they are rendered that way in secular usage of the language. So the Holy Spirit is compared to air. That is the most clear-cut analogy and the one that God himself draws by the very word that he chose to describe spirit. And uh, when, you know, it makes understandable references like, for instance, in Jeremiah 23, uh, 23, 24, when, when God talks about filling the heavens and the earth. Well, how does God fill the heavens and the earth? 
You know, we read in the scriptures about the Most High uh, residing in the third heaven and Jesus Christ sitting on his right hand. And we know uh, from 1 Corinthians 15 that in the resurrection we will have a spiritual body. It, it uses that term, a spiritual body. There's a natural body and a spiritual body. And we're going to have a body like Christ has, uh, a spiritual body. So uh, God has... Uh, you, you know, when it talks about God filling the heavens and the earth, well, God has the, the Father as a spiritual body. Christ has a spiritual body, says that uh, very clearly, and brings that out in 1 Corinthians 15. But when God fills the heavens and the earth, how does he do that? Well, he does that through his Spirit. You know, if you had... If, what happens if you have a container that is filled with, with compressed gas or that is filled with oxygen or something of that sort? What happens if you open it up? It spreads out, doesn't it? It expands out. And it fills wherever there is. You know, when we're told uh, that we all partake of one spirit, well, you know, we all breathe the same air. We're all in this room. All of us are sitting here. How do we all partake of the same air? Well, it fills. God fills heaven and earth. And he does so through his spirit. So, one of the first analogies and uh, most basic analogies that are drawn in Scripture is an analogy to air or wind or breath. A second analogy that is often used in the Scripture also uh, is an analogy of water. The Holy Spirit is compared to water, to rivers of living water, flowing water. You see, not, not a stagnant pool somewhere, but rivers of living water, of flowing water. God's Spirit is something that can be poured out. It is something that flows. So it's compared to, to water. Uh, air uh, is compared to air in the sense that it permeates and fills. It's compared to water in the sense that it flows or is poured out. There are other analogies that are given uh, in the Scripture. In one place it's, it's uh, likened to a couple of, several places actually, it's likened to olive oil. Uh, particularly in the context of oil that was used uh, as the fuel for the lamps. Uh, there in the tabernacle and later in the temple. It was the fuel that was burned. Uh, and the lamps provided a light. And that analogy is given, and that Christians are to be a light to the world. And of course, what is it that enabled the, the lamp in the tabernacle or the temple to burn and, and to give light? It was the presence of olive oil, this fuel. What is it that allows us as Christians to be a light to the world? Well, it is the presence of God's Holy Spirit in us. In that sense, it is... Uh, the, the fuel for the lamp. Um, and and uh, we could go on. There are many, many other places. Here, there is, an, uh, there is an analogy used in terms of God's Spirit and our utilization of it. Because we're told that the gift of God must be stirred up within us. Now, the specific analogy, and if you check it, in some other translations or commentaries, they'll bring out the use of the word here, um, stirred up, is, is a term that means a stirring to life. And the expression is used of, of the embers or coals of a fire. Now, I guess a lot of us have uh, uh, had, at least in, in times past, a lot of you may have fireplaces, and a lot of us grew up with uh, uh, old, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, wood stoves and things like that. And uh, so... When you, have, when you have something like that, the fire dies down, and what happens? If you want to, you've got to stir it up, to stir up those coals, and the ash layer comes off, and what may look to be the fire having gone out, if you stir it up a little bit and begin to add some new fuel, you've got it blazing up. But it has to be stirred to life. To where, in that sense, the air is able to get back to the live coals, to the spark of life that is there. And as the air is gotten back to it, you know, if you stir it up like uh, maybe you've been on a camping trip or something and the fire died down overnight and you get up the next morning and uh, you, you stir it up and you see there's some live coals there and you blow on it a little bit and put some, put some dry tinder down there and pretty soon it, it flames up. Now... This is the analogy that Paul is drawing right here. You stir up the gift of God that is within you. So we can have God's Spirit within us and it can die down. To where instead of being a blazing fire, a blazing flame, with white heat, it begins to grow cold. 
Now, you know, lukewarm is a stage you pass on the way from hot to cold. It's sort of the in-between stage. You don't get cold unless you've got, if you started out hot, you don't get, you don't get cold unless you became lukewarm first. Now, when Paul is admonishing Timothy here, the admonition is given to people that there's still a little heat there. You know, they're not totally cold and the embers are dead. You know, you can come along on a fire that has totally died out and it's gone and you can stir all night and you'll never get any spark out of there because every spark is gone. Doesn't do any good to stir up that sort of fire. You know, that's the way you're supposed to leave. I know when I was a, a kid in Boy Scouts, you know, that was the way they instructed us. Uh, we, we would go out and we'd have these camping trips and we were supposed to leave the fire where nobody could come back and stir it up. You didn't want to leave something that's going to burn the woods down, you know. So you pour water on it and you, 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 you spread it out and make sure that the coals are out and that, uh, that the heat is gone. Well, that's not the condition. You know, they're, they're God, some of God's people may be hot and may be zealous, and there are others that may be at various uh, temperatures all the way down to sort of tepid and lukewarm. But if they're God's people, they're not totally cold. There's a spark left. We're told here that we have to stir up that gift of God that is within us. We have to keep it stirred up. And what about, what are we told here about that spirit? God has not given us the spirit of fear. He's not given us the spirit of fear, but he's given us the spirit of power, the spirit of love, and the spirit of sound-mindedness. Now, this term for fear, there are a couple of terms that are used for fear in the New Testament. This is a term that does not refer, uh, it, the, the term that's used here is a term that's never used to refer to the fear of God. Uh, it, it is a term that means basically uh, uh, being timid and cowardly is the expression that is used here. It's not the term that is ever used to refer to the fear of God, which has to do uh, with, with an awe, with being overwhelmed by uh, something. This uh, has to do that God's spirit is not the spirit of cowardice. It is not the spirit of, uh, you know, sort of running away and hiding. Let, let's notice a couple of places where that term is used to understand what uh, uh, what Jesus, uh, the way it's used here by Jesus, uh, we're going to notice a couple of accounts in the Gospels that uh, in uh, John chapter 14, in verse 27, as Christ was uh, uh, talking about the giving of the Holy Spirit, and in verse 27 he said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice, because I said I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Now, Jesus Christ talked about the fact of, is he was here instructing the disciples prior to his, his crucifixion, and he said that uh, uh, the peace that he left was the peace that comes from God. He said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Don't be timid and cowardly, he was telling the disciples as they were preparing to face, to face life, to face things without his physical presence there. The point that he's making is, look, I'm not going to be here with you physically, but I will be with you spiritually. Because if I go away, I'm going to send something. And what I'm going to send is the Holy Spirit of God, the Comforter. The one to send that Spirit of God that, as we're going to see, is the source of power and love and sound-mindedness. So the disciples were told not to, uh, to be fearful and timid and cowardly. As we notice back in, in uh, Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4 and verse 40, we have an account. Um, in verse 37 of Mark 4, it talks about a great storm rising, and uh, Christ was in the hinder part of the, of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they woke him up, and they said, Master, don't you care that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and he said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? 
And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? You know, he said, Why are you so fearful? Why are you just uh, overwhelmed here uh, and, and, uh, uh, and frightened? In a, in, a, in a cowardly way, because you have no faith. So, they were confronting a crisis, they were confronting a problem, and their response was not the response of faith, of confidence and trust in God. God's spirit is not the spirit of cowardice and timidity, but it is first and foremost the spirit of power. Now, what is the spirit of power? There are three things that God's spirit conveys to us as it's placed within us, God's Spirit transmits and is the source of His power, the source in us of His power. It's the means by which God accomplishes His powerful works. It's the Spirit of power. It is the Spirit of love. It is the means by which God changes and, and let's say, places within us His nature, imparts to us His very nature because God is love. And it is also the means by which God uh, gives to us a spirit of sound-mindedness. Soundness in, of judgment and wisdom. So, the Spirit of God has to do with power. It has to do with love and attitude. And it has to do with understanding. It unlocks our understanding of the truth. It imparts to us God's nature. And it is the spirit of power. Now, let's look a little more fully at what it means to be the spirit of power. The word rendered power here is a word that means power or force or ability. It's a word that is commonly used in the New Testament for miracles, though it can mean other things as well. The word that is the root of this in the Greek language is the word dunamis, from which we get our word dynamic. So in that sense, it is the concept of dynamic power, of working power, of power that accomplishes. In Matthew chapter 11, in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus Christ is here speaking, we're, we're told in, in verse 20 of Matthew 11, Then began he, began Christ, to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done. Because they repented not. Now, the word mighty works is this same word, dunamis, or power. He began to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works and his dynamic power was manifested. Because they did not repent. They saw the evidence of the power of God and they didn't change their lives. They didn't listen in spite of the fact of the very evidence of God's power that was demonstrated right there. He said in verse 21, Woe unto you, Chorazin! Woe unto you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works, same word, if the mighty works, if the power which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes long ago. So God's spirit is the spirit of power. Here, referring to dynamic, miraculous works accomplished in the account in Matthew 11, personally by Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, here we find Christ uh, answering questions of the Sadducees. They were trying to trip him up and entangle him and, and uh, find fault, and in uh, Matthew chapter 22 and verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, uh, because they were, you know, had this long convoluted question about uh, a man dying uh, or a woman dying after she'd been married seven times, and uh, whose husband or whose wife would she be, and and all of this, uh, uh, you know, this crazy question. Because the reason they were asking questions, they didn't believe in the resurrection anyway, and they thought, boy, this would, uh, you know, this would really trip him up. And Jesus answered verse twenty nine and said, "You do err, not knowing the scriptures." nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So, he emphasizes the power of God. The power of God is the means by which the resurrection will occur. How do you take a dead body and transform it from matter, from flesh and blood, from decaying organic matter 
Do you enliven it and transform it from being a physical body to being a spiritual body? And that, of course, it talks about directly in 1 Corinthians 15. How do you do that? Through the power of God. If the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, your mortal body shall he also quicken, make alive by that spirit that dwells in you. Romans 8. See, by the power of God, by the spirit of God. The spirit of God is the spirit of dynamic power. Let's notice in, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 35. In verse 30, an angel addressed Mary in Luke chapter 1 and told her not to fear that she had found favor with God, that she would conceive in her womb and bring forth a son and would call his name Jesus, that he would be great, the son of the highest, would be given the throne of his father David, would reign over the house of Jacob forever, of his kingdom there shall be no end. Mary asked the question to the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? She was a virgin. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power, same word, the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. Because the conception that was to occur was unique in the history of humanity. There was not a physical father. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Almighty, the power of the highest, shall overshadow you. The term power here is the same term. So the Holy Spirit is the, is the spirit of power. It is the means by which God performed this miracle. Through the power of his Holy Spirit which flows out from God. In Luke chapter 24, as Jesus was preparing to ascend to heaven, in verse 48 of Luke 24, he said, You are my witnesses of these things. You've seen it. You've observed it. You know it to be a fact. You can bear testimony of it. In verse 49, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, But tarry you in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So they were to remain until the promise of the Father would be sent. They would be imbued with power from on high. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of power. And they were to wait until they had that power placed within them. They were not to go out and to do the work based on their own strength and their own power, based on their own energy, based on what they could do. Because, you know, the best that we can do on our own is far, far short of what needs to be done. So he told them, he said, wait, and you will be given power from on high. The same power that 33 and a half, or well, actually a little over 34 years prior to that, had overshadowed Mary and had been the instrument or the agency by which this miracle took place. That the one that was the Logos, the spokesman uh, in the Old Testament, actually became uh, an embryo in the womb of Mary. In Acts chapter 1, let's go on. It follows right up from the account there in the book of, Acts, in the book of Luke. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the disciples had asked Jesus as he was preparing to ascend to heaven if it was right at this point time to restore the kingdom to Israel. Verse 6, and he said, no, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. And verse 8, but you shall receive power. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be witnesses unto me. They would testify concerning the things that they knew and had seen. You know, it's important to understand that the primary issue, particularly in the, uh, the middle, in, in the world there, the general Palestinian world, the issue was not whether the Sabbath is in force and effect. 
or whether Christmas and Easter are pagan holidays, uh, you know, or God's people ought to keep the festivals. That, that wasn't the issue. These people were Jews. And, and that wasn't the issue at all. The issue was, is Jesus of Nazareth the Messiah that was promised in the prophecies of the Old Testament? You know, you emphasize the things that people don't understand. And there was an emphasis that the apostles bore first-hand witness of the fact that God had raised from the dead Jesus of Nazareth. They had seen it with their eyes. And they were witnesses of that. And they bore witness of it, and that was the, that, that's what the term witness uh, means. You, you know, witness in court, somebody that's seen something. You know, you're called as a witness. If you don't know anything about it, you can't be a witness. You're called as a witness because you know something, you have first-hand knowledge. You know, when a witness is called to testify, he can't testify on hearsay evidence. You have to testify to what you personally know to be a fact. And the apostles were, in that sense, they were witnesses in the literal sense of the word. They had borne witness to certain events that had occurred, and they were able to testify to that fact. He said, but you shall receive power. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of power. Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. Peter's sermon, he said, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles. The word is translated miracles here is the same word we've seen rendered power elsewhere. A man approved of God among you by miracles, by miraculous power and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as you yourself have known. Then he told them how they had taken and crucified him and God had raised him from the dead. We could go on, we could look, uh, just notice a couple of other places in in Acts chapter 4. Here's a little different use of the term, but but still in the same sense. This is an account of Peter preaching. And uh, the uh, uh, Peter and John had been arrested and had been uh, told to quit preaching. Quit preaching the truth. Verse 17 of Acts 4. That it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak Henceforth to no man in this name. Oh, they thought, well, look, we can intimidate these guys. We'll get them over here and we'll threaten them. We'll say, you better not say anything about that again. You better quit talking about that. So we'll threaten you and we'll intimidate you. They called them and commanded them not to speak or to teach in the name of Jesus. Oh, you know, that's going to do it. We're going to get you in here and there's going to be a whole bunch of us. And we're going to intimidate you. We're going to get you in a corner over here. And you guys, and we're, we're all this Sanhedrin and all these, uh, uh, this great, uh, uh, you know, these great learned individuals, the high priest and all of those there with him. And we're going to get you in here and we're going to intimidate you and we're going to command you to quit preaching. So they did so. And Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God. You judge. Oh, I hadn't expected that answer. I figured, why? You get these guys in here, you know, and all of us uh, in here, and they're going to be scared. They're going to be intimidated. So they further threatened them. And they let them go. Not finding how they could punish them. They couldn't figure out a charge against them. So they threatened them some more. Now, as we come on down the account, the, uh, in verse 29, Now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto your servants that all with all boldness they may speak your word. So Peter asked God, and he said, Look, he said, you see their threatenings, and they're trying to intimidate us, and they're trying to, to, uh, to do all these things. Give your servants boldness to speak your word by stretching forth your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done in the name of of your holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken wherein they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. They spoke the word of God with boldness. 
So we find right here that when this term boldness is the same word power. Same word. So here they were speaking the, the term power. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of power, the spirit of boldness to stand for God's truth. The spirit of power by which God accomplishes his acts, works miracles. The spirit of boldness. Well, we could go on. Let's just notice one other account back in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. The same God that said, let there be light, has also caused the light of his truth to shine in our hearts and our minds to where we have been able to see the truth. Brethren, it's a miracle to see the truth. It takes the miraculous power of God to open our minds to understand the truth. We're told in verse 7, we have this treasure, and that's what it is. God's truth is a precious treasure that must be guarded. It must be valued. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power, there's our word again, may be of God and not of us. You know, we're frail, weak, limited human beings. This treasure... This precious truth of God that our minds have been open to understand is present in earthen vessels. We're mortal matter made of the dust. We're frail, we're weak, we get tired. Paul said, look, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Oh, we go through our problems and we have our frailties and we're weak and we're limited, and we get tired. But God has given us this treasure, this precious treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The power is not something we generate from within ourselves. The Holy Spirit of God is not something that originates within us. It originates with God, and it unites with the spirit of man within our minds. To empower us. To empower us. The power to hold fast and to have boldness for the truth. The power to work miracles. God does work miracles. Many of you have experienced those miracles in your life. I've experienced them in mine. I've seen them take place under my hands. Powerful miracles. They didn't originate with me, and they didn't originate with you. They originated with the great God of heaven, who has given us the spirit of power. He's also given us the spirit of love. God's spirit is not only the spirit of great power. It is also the spirit of God's transforming love. In Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. We're told in verse 3 that tribulation or trials and tests work patience. They work endurance. And this endurance produces experience, tested character. And that leads to hope. And hope makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. The love of God, shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit given unto us. God's Holy Spirit places within us the very nature, the very essence of the nature of God, which is God's love. 
God's love we have in us as a result of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit is not merely the spirit of power. It is the spirit that transforms our nature. The hostility, the vanity, the jealousy, the lust, the greed, all of the things that have motivated us. There is an inner transformation of our very nature that takes place. And the Holy Spirit is what accomplishes that. It is a miracle of God to change our nature. To change the very essence of what we are and what our motives are down deep inside. In Matthew chapter 24, we're given a warning. Matthew 24 and verse 12. We're told, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Because iniquity, because lawlessness, and that's what the term means. Because lawlessness shall abound, a disregard and a disrespect for the fundamental law of God. Because lawlessness shall abound, the love of many will begin to grow cold. And again, lukewarm is a state between being hot and being cold. If you grow cold, if you start from heat and you grow cold, you pass lukewarm on the way down. Love and law are tied together and you cannot separate them because you cannot understand true love apart from law. You cannot understand true love apart from law. Law defines what love really is. If you take the law away, then love is reduced to sort of a feeling and an emotion. And that's not love. That's just a feeling and an emotion. The real love of God is reflected in an, in an attitude and a way of thinking that channels out in terms of relationships toward God and relationships with people. Relationships with God and relationships with neighbor reflects God's love, and we're warned. We live in a world that is beset with a disregard and a disrespect for law, a selfish, self-centered, I want to do what I want to do, and I don't want anybody telling me what to do, sort of an attitude. That sort of an attitude is the very opposite of love, which is a concern for others. Let's notice back in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter, uh, let's pick it up in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5 and verse 13, he says, Brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. No, the liberty that we're given is not the liberty to go out and sin. That's slavery. Use not liberty as an occasion for the flesh, but by love serve one another. Now, it's not enough just to serve one another. You must, by love, serve one another. You know, it's not enough simply to do the right thing. You've got to do the right thing for the right reason. See, God is interested in the transformation of what we are on the inside. Now, if what we are on the inside tra is transformed, what we do on the outside will also be transformed. You cannot be transformed in the inner man and remain the way you were on the outer man. That's impossible. Because the love of God will reflect itself with God's standards and values and God's law. Though it is possible for someone to put on the show of the outer without the inner transformation. You know, some people can put, on, can put religion on and off like their Sabbath suit. And in certain settings they wear their religion. And then they go hang up their religion and they don't get it out again for a while. And they don't want it to interfere with the way they treat their wife or their husband or their children or their neighbors, uh, the way they conduct themselves on the job, uh, the way they interact with others. They, they sort of get their religion out for special occasions. That's not what God's talking about at all. He's talking about the Holy Spirit is what transforms us in the inner man. It is the spirit of love. The love of God shed abroad in our hearts through the power of God's Spirit. On down here in, in Galatians, uh, as we come on down. But by love, serve one another. 
Verse 14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You know, love is the fulfilling of the law. If you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. You get into a spirit of hostility, a hostile spirit toward one another, and begin to try to tear down and assail one another. When we bite and devour one another, we will be consumed. This I say, walk in the Spirit. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The, the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. You can't just go with the flow. You can't just do the things that you used to do. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. To be under the law means to be under the penalty of the law. The wages of sin is death. Sin is the transgression of the law, and the wages of sin is death. To be under the law is to be under the death penalty. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the penalty of the law. You're being led by the Spirit, because where will God's Spirit lead us? He leads us in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Read it back in the 23rd Psalm. What is righteousness? Psalm 119. Verse 172, all thy commandments are righteousness. If you're led by the Spirit of God, you're following the pathway of obedience to God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You know, a true Christian is one who's led by the Spirit of God, and God's Spirit will only lead you one way. It will lead you in the pathways of righteousness. Jesus described that as a straight and narrow way. And few there be that find it. You can't look around and just see the way that the world is going, figure, you know, you get on the road, everybody else is going on, that must be the right one, because there are a bunch of people on it. Well, you go back and you read what Jesus Christ said himself. So if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Here are the works of the flesh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lawlessness, lasciviousness. These are things that are contrary to the law. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, you know, all these various things. The, the, uh, uh, all of these, and you can go through and you can tie in every one of these to one of the commandments of God. Ra uh, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in times past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If you live in the Spirit, let, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. It has to do with a way of life. Love, from a biblical standpoint, is not just sort of this, this feel-good emotion. It's not just sort of this, this little uh, sweet feeling. Love, from a biblical standpoint, is a way of living. It is a way of living that originates with an attitude. On the inside, the attitude that is the very nature of God. Not just sort of this little nicey nice feeling, you know, the world's filled with people who like to talk about love. But they don't live the way of those, you know, the hippies make love, not war. Now, they didn't understand what love was. What they meant was go off and fornicate. No, that's what they meant. You know, the, the Woodstock Rock Fest. You know, get high on drugs and fornicate. That's not the love of God. That's love. That, that's lust. That's the works of the flesh. You see, if you don't have the law, then you don't know what love is. Let's continue on the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. 
According as he has chosen us in him, God has chosen us to be in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So, God has, has chosen and predetermined ahead of time a people who would be holy, who would have his very nature and character stamped within them, who would be without blame. Their sins would be paid for. The debt of their sin would be marked paid in full by the blood of Jesus Christ. But it was not simply without blame. It was also to be holy. You see, our sins are forgiven so that we can be transformed and made holy. Be before God in love. In love. Because that's what God's Holy Spirit does. Continuing on down in Ephesians chapter 3. Let's look a little bit here. Here's a very interesting thing that, that gives us a little bit of insight. Ephesians uh, chapter 3. In verse 4, we'll pick it up. Paul reads, Whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So he talks about the mystery here. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So here's something that was not previously known, but now can be. And he goes on, not only was it made revealed to the holy apostles and prophets, but that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of the promise uh, in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God, working given unto me by the effectual working of his power, he goes on unto me, least of the apostles, uh, verse 9, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things at my Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So the, this is the, the very plan, the very essence of the plan of God is called here uh, the mystery. Revealed now to the apostles uh, and the prophets, uh, Paul was proclaiming it among the Gentiles, and they were going to be able to be fellow heirs of that. According, verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have, access, we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulation for you, which is for your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the might with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, which is what? That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's the mystery. Christ dwelling in you, in your hearts by faith, being rooted and grounded in love. Being rooted and grounded in love. That's what anchors us. Being able to comprehend the enormity of God's love, which leads to ultimately our being filled with all the fullness of God. Can we comprehend what that means? God is transforming us and placing His nature within us. The love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're told in Ephesians 4 and verse 2, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, putting up with one another in love. On down in verse 15, speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. You see, Christ is the one that we're trying to emulate. And we need to speak the truth in love. And the purpose of speaking the truth in love is helping the people of God to grow up to become just like Jesus Christ. Let's come on back to First Peter. Let's uh, sort of 
hurry on along here. First Peter chapter four. First Peter chapter four. We'll pick it up in, in verse seven. But the end of all things, the word here is is like apocalypse or apocalypsis, uh, the revelation of all things. Same word is used for the title of the book of Revelation. The end of all things, the revealing of all things, the unveiling of all things is at hand. Be you therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent love. Fervent charity, and the word here, same word for love. Fervent love among yourselves, for love shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. The love of God. You know, and as the time draws close, we need to draw close to God in prayer and understanding. And above all things, have fervent love among ourselves. Because that is the very essence of the nature and character of God. We need to have that sort of love. Real, deep, godly concern and love for one another. It's easy to get exasperated with one another and frustrated with one another. You know, it's no big deal to show love to somebody that's being nice to you. Everybody can be nice to people, or almost everybody. I've met a few that had trouble, but almost everybody can be nice to somebody that's being nice to them. Somebody does you a favor, well, you sort of feel like doing something nice for them. Somebody comes up with a big cheery smile and they say hello to you, you sort of feel like saying hi to them. It's easy to be nice to someone who's being nice to us. We've got to go beyond that as the people of God. If if that's all we do, uh, we're no different than the world around us. You know, the world's filled with people. I mean, maybe even guys in the mafia uh, say hello to one another. Uh, You you know, you don't have to be... uh, uh, you don't have to be a great Christian to be nice to your buddy, the guy that just got through doing you a favor, or the guy you want a favor out of. We're to have fervent love. Fervent love. Real, intense love among ourselves. And all the little frustrations and irritations and aggravations, we're told that love covers a multitude of sins. We're willing to overlook things. For someone we love. You know, we're willing to say, hey, you know, she had a bad day or she or he's having a bad day or or this or that. And it doesn't mean that we excuse the sin, but we still love the sinner. Fervent love. Because that's the very essence of the nature of God. Let's just notice here a couple of more things about love. We'll, we'll pick it out in First John chapter two. First John chapter two. In verse three, it says, "Hereby we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments." He that says, "I know him," and keeps not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth's not in him. But whoso keeps his word, in him truly is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we're in him. He that says he abides in him, all, himself also to walk, even as he walked. So, we're told that if we keep His Word, then the love of God is perfected or brought to completion in us. The way in which we reflect the the love of God is by keeping God's Word. It is by keeping the Word of God. We keep His Word, then the love of God is perfected. You see, the Word of God tells you how to love. It tells you what is love and what is not love. That's why we're told in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. God's commandments are not some grievous yoke. They're not some great burden. They're the perfect law of liberty. They're the way of love. God has given us the spirit of power. He's given us the spirit of love, real love, godly love. 
The love of God shed abroad in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not only the spirit of power and of love, but also the spirit of a sound mind. The spirit of a sound mind. Now, let's understand a little bit about that. What does that mean? First thing we see is the Spirit empowers us with boldness. The Spirit transforms our nature on the inside. And the Spirit also works with our mind to give us a clear, balanced perspective. The word that's translated sound-mindedness uh, literally means uh, wise mind. Wise mind. It means to be wise, to be sensible, to be sober, to be using and exercising good judgment. You know, that's the way we use the word sober. Sober as opposed to being uh, intoxicated, you know. That's why uh, somebody is given a DWI dry, uh, where they're... Uh, or, or, uh, or, uh, they're driving while intoxicated. They're driving under the influence. Driving under the influence. Their, their judgment is impaired. See, that's why it's a crime to drive under the influence of drugs and alcohol. Because your judgment is impaired. So you need to be sober. You need to be able to exercise wise judgment and not be impaired in your ability to think. Now, the whole world, religiously, is described as being intoxicated. That's what we're told back in Revelation 17, you know. The whole world is drunken with the wine of the great whore of Babylon. And so, the world is described as spiritually intoxicated. Their judgment is impaired. Their understanding, their perception is grossly impaired. As the people of God, we need to be sober. We need to be sober. The Spirit of God is the spirit of sobriety, the spirit of sound-mindedness, the ability to make wise and sensible choices, to have clear understanding and perception, perception of reality. Because, you know, when you're under the influence, your perception of reality is altered. It's impaired. That's what being under the influence, that's, that's the danger of it, the problem of it, just from a human or a physical standpoint. Well, God is addressing here the spirit of sound-mindedness. Let's notice a few places where this is used. In Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. The uh, yeah, uh, well, that's not the let's see, I think that's yeah, I, excuse me, this was Mark chapter five, that's what I needed. No wonder I couldn't find it in. In, uh, in Mark chapter 5, we have the story of the individual known as Legion. He was uh, a man who was totally uh, demented, possessed by a legion of demon spirits, and uh, just was wild and insane in his actions. Jesus cast the demons out. Uh, you read the story. I won't go through it all. And... Uh, the unclean spirits went out in Mark 5 and verse 13. And in verse 15 of Mark 5, when the people came to Jesus, they saw him that had been possessed with demons, and it had the legion. They saw him sitting, clothed, and in his right mind. And they were afraid. But the term for right mind here is the same word, sound-minded. They saw him sitting there, Perfectly reasonable, with understanding and perception. They saw him sitting there in a normal way. They saw him perfectly reasonable, sound and with a sound mind. 
Let's go back to Romans chapter 12, because that's what God wants us to have. God's Spirit is not some crazy thing. It's not the Spirit that produces uh, in craziness and insanity. You know, when you look at uh, the tragic event that occurred back a few weeks ago, or, or occurred over a period of time, culminated a few weeks ago in, in Waco, Texas, that was certainly not the spirit of sound-mindedness. That was the spirit of craziness. That was a demonic spirit. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. This is the word that's translated sound-minded back in 2 Timothy 1. But to think in a sound-minded way, to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. How do we arrive at sound-minded thinking? God's Spirit gives and imparts to us the spirit of a sound mind. Now, a spirit of a sound mind is not a spirit that leads us to be conformed to the world, to fit in and take our shape from the world around us. It's not the Spirit that leads us to conformity to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Because our mind, if it's going to be sound, it has to be renewed. You see, the carnal mind is not a sound mind. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The carnal mind is not sound-minded in the spiritual sense. Certainly can be on a, you know, on a physical level and on a human level. People can apply sound principles of, of uh, worldly wisdom. But in terms of an understanding of the truth, that's something that ultimately has to be spiritually discerned. You know, we're told that. Paul brings it out in 1 Corinthians 2. What man knows the things of a man except for the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no man knows the things of God except for the spirit of God. The spirit of God imparts to us spiritual understanding. It enables us to understand and discern spiritual principles, spiritual things. That's why there was a definite point in your life when the Bible made sense. You know, I remember in my life, I remember growing up in, in, in the Baptist church and going to church every Sunday morning and every Sunday evening and learning various things out of the Bible and memorizing scriptures and, and, and all of these things, uh, getting involved in a, in, a, in, a, in a little organization that was uh, uh, called Bible Memory Association. And we memorized uh, portions of scripture. Well, that was all well and good, and I'm glad that I learned those portions of Scripture. They've, they've uh, stood me in good stead, uh, been helpful over the years. But you know what? I didn't understand what they meant. I read it. I heard it. I went to church. But I didn't understand the truth. I didn't understand the truth. And there came a definite point in my life when... The truth began to make sense. Well, I'd listen to the broadcast for on and off, you know, bits and pieces a year or two. I remember hearing comments about uh, uh, Christmas, and I thought that was crazy. I thought that was crazy that anybody would think you shouldn't put up a Christmas tree. That wasn't crazy. That was sound-minded. I was the one that was crazy. But I didn't understand that until the Spirit of God began to open my mind to understand the truth. And all of a sudden, a lot of things that I had thought were good and sounded good and great, it wasn't that the world was turned upside down. The world was already upside down. God just turned it right side up. See, they accused Paul of turning the world upside down. He wasn't turning it upside down. They were upside down to begin with. 
He just turned it right side up. The truth of God, God's spirit is the spirit of sound mindedness. Let's, uh, let's speed up here. I'm going to speed up very quickly. Uh, first Timothy here. Uh, first Timothy chapter two. Well, here it refers, it talks, it talks to, uh, women, uh, here in, in first Timothy chapter two and the way that they're to conduct themselves and it uses the term sobriety in verse nine, which is sound minded, uh, and, and on down, uh, uh, here talking about the, uh, the, uh, approach that they're to have. We, we could look back in Titus, uh, where it, it, uh, addresses it in Titus, uh, uh Chapter 1 and verse 8, it talks about that uh, uh, an elder ought to be one who is sober or sound-minded. In Titus 1 and verse 8, uh, we're told on down in Titus uh, chapter 2 and verse 5 that uh, the older women need to teach the younger women to be discreet or to be uh, decent and modest, using good judgment, sound-minded. You see, it's a, it's a term that reflects a way of thinking. And we could go into it. It applies to women, and it applies to men, it applies to, to elders, it applies to Christians. The way it reflects itself is going to reflect itself in the choices we make. It describes here, like in the context of a woman, uh, that the Spirit of God is the Spirit of sound mindedness. It will reflect itself in, in modest and discreet dress and, and what's appropriate in terms of behavior and grooming. It will reflect itself in actions of what's appropriate, of what's uh, of, of sound judgment. Uh, there, there, uh, place after place that we could go to, to, uh, look at that. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15, we're told to walk circumspectly, walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise, as being sound-minded. The way we walk through life is not just carelessly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil, wherefore be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord it is. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of sound-mindedness, the Spirit of clear understanding of the truth. The Spirit of sound-mindedness, the Spirit of clear understanding of the truth. God wants us to have clarity of mind, to have a balanced way of life, reflecting itself in the way that we conduct ourselves, in the way that we handle things, being sound-minded. Learning to exercise and utilize good judgment. In the book of James, chapter 3, James chapter 3, in verse 13, it says, Who's a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conduct his works with meekness of wisdom. If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthy, sensual, and devilish. Where envying and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. So sound-mindedness is not going to be tied in with envying and strife and, and, and uh, this sort of uh, devilish wisdom. But the wisdom that comes from above is first pure and peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Great peace have those that love thy law. It is based on a sound-minded, solid approach. Let's just notice in conclusion back here in 2 Timothy again. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul told Timothy in the beginning of the book of 2 Timothy in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, to stir up the gift of God that was within him through the laying on of hands. God has not given us the spirit of fear, the spirit of, of cowardice, but he's given us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. He warns Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that in the last days perilous times will come. People will be self-focused and self-centered. We're told on down... In verse 4, that they'll be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. We're told in verse 7, they'll be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Like Janus and Jambres that withstood Moses. These men resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. They shall proceed no further. Their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was, as Janice and Jambres were. You see, not sound-minded, but ever-learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Paul talks about persecutions. 
In verse 13, the fact that evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But he told Timothy, don't be afraid. Continue you in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you've learned them. From a child you've known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, complete, mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God's Spirit is the spirit of sound-mindedness. And God's Word instructs us in soundness of behavior and conduct. God's Spirit enables us to understand So Paul admonished Timothy, chapter 4, verse 1, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, the instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all all longsuffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Not endure the sound-mindedness that comes from God. Not endure sound doctrine, but after their own loss shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So Paul warned and admonished Timothy, and certainly it's a warning and an admonition to all of us. We need very much to stir up that gift of God which is within us. Realizing that what God has given us is the spirit of power and boldness. The spirit of love that transforms our thinking, our nature. And he's given us the spirit of a sound mind that opens our mind to understand and to discern the truth. And we need to hold that fast, and we need to stir up that gift of God within us. And as we approach the day of Pentecost and focus in upon it and what it means... We need to realize how desperately we need that Spirit of God, that Spirit of dynamic power, of deep, profound love, and of a sound mind.